So we won this X Prize. It started in 2007, and I was running, amongst other things, a, a racing team, and I was simply looking at how do you build an efficient car. The car you see there is in the Henry Ford Museum, and it's the car we won it with, and I'll explain how we came about to doing it this way. At the end, you can't change anything unless you really change something. So we looked at how cars are made, and we recognized that car companies have a lot of smart, talented engineers, but getting to 100 miles per gallon was apparently rather impossible. So let's look at the structure of a car. Henry Ford came up with the assembly line, which created mass production, which changed our country and the rest of the world. A very simple platform came next, and now I'll show you the latest innovation, which is 1959. The cars we have today are nothing but a derivative of this architecture. So what we did is we came up with a new architecture, which was driven by a tiny suspension system, which allowed us to create a different kind of chassis. And we went on and won the prize. Now I'm going to shift gears. So we kept working after we won the prize. We kept refining it. And I gave speeches, hundreds of speeches. I met people in car companies. And there's a pattern that emerges. You meet 10 engineers and two love what you do. And a few others think it's pretty cool. And they investigate it and they say, yeah, this seems to work. And then people say, maybe we don't want to change our billion dollar operation. Maybe we don't until something happens. Let me shift gears. We're actually kind of racing to the bottom. Our average incomes are going down, and at the same time, we hear of a middle class emerging in the rest of the world. Let me just define middle class. In Africa, they say it's $2 a day in income. It doesn't change the fact that there are millions of people. As a matter of fact, they project 3 billion people who eventually want to live the way we want to live. And this is an unsustainable situation. So in 2001, there were 374 million cars. In 2011, it became over a billion. We all know what cars do. And people have a right and wish to have this. So it's mostly happening in Asia, but it's going to happen worldwide. There's another tiger in the room, which we see with Greece failing, Europe reeling, all those things. It's essentially balance of trade. Balance of trade gives money to some countries and eventually indebts other countries and its people. And the biggest creator of imbalances of trade is the shifting of cars and energy. Because cars are simply so expensive and because we choose to build them following the 1959 model in very large factories, which tend to cost a huge amount of money and are not very flexible in changing what they produce. And the original issues, which created the X Prize, and which are dear to me and many people, have not gone away. The environment is a concern. Congestion in cities is only growing, wasting time, resources, etc. And in my opinion, very important is the exhaustion of natural resources, which ultimately drives the increase of price of resources and will ultimately continue to drive what happens to our incomes. So when things don't go right, you end up with a revolution, which in Ukraine they had one, and they're working their way out of it. But this is a worldwide pressure. So I'm going to shift once again. I'm going to shift to the cellular telephones. It's highly appropriate, because we are here at Morven Farm, a place that used to belong to John Kluge, and John Kluge made his big money by investing in cellular telephones in Eastern Europe a lot. Anyway, what happened effectively is the emergence of cellular telephones allowed the jumping of the infrastructure barrier that connected people. In the old days, you had to create landlines, and that's how you got your telephone. And in many countries that didn't function as well, the landlines became very, very difficult to, uh, to get. You'd have to wait 10 years, and they were prohibitively expensive. When the cellular telephones came, it jumped over this capital barrier, and the world became connected. 
Now we will shift again. We go to what I call a 10 times efficiency gain that is to me clearly coming. So just remember, I've had this eight year journey now. I'm in the automobile business industry, know a lot of people and self-driving cars come along and they are the absolute tiger in the room. It's not always obvious. They will become a hardware leap, similar to cellular telephones. Because most of us, a car represents one of the most valuable things we have. And there's a convergence of technology that is absolutely making this possible. I suspect five years from now, driverless cars will exist in significant number, not to the point where everybody uses them, but truly demonstrating that they function. And this is simply coming because a lot of stuff is lining up. Learning machines are essentially computers who through the cloud can learn from each other, cars that can talk to each other. This allows visual recognition to work. With visual recognition, you end up with $20 cameras. The net result is that to make a car not have to have a driver will ultimately cost $1,500. And that is a very stunning number. Separate from that, obviously connected people, device payment systems. Um, in my opinion, technologies like ours, building cars from, with fewer parts, less connected pieces, will eventually simply create an environment where there's a major economic pressure toward a different kind of car. Really what it boils down to is that the capital requirement for individual transportation goes away. And I will argue that individual transportation is the foundation of the original wealth boost that we've had in Western Europe and in the United States. Connectedness is the second one, and now comes this. So I come from the automobile industry. Initially, I was skeptical. I like to drive, and I would say, you know, most of us aren't going to give up our cars. Today, I see this very, very different. And I would argue that this may be a Kodak moment, but a different kind of Kodak moment than we know. Essentially, if we remember, Kodak were the people who invented the digital photography. And they were also the people who, for the most part, missed what happened. And the people who ended up going the furthest with digital photography are people who make telephones. So there's a major shift in what's happening. So one of the things that will happen with autonomous cars, simply because they function completely differently, the whole relationship to a car will change. A car will simply move you from one place to another, and it will become a place where you, you want the place to function for you. The cars will be tailor-made. I believe the cars will be almost exclusively fleet-operated, which means you will have an app on your telephone, which means you don't have to put the money out for a car. The use cycles, because the cars are, fleet, are operated by fleets, will become longer. Cars will go, I would guess initially, roughly 800,000 miles. And they will continuously run. They'll be updated. And the only thing that really, really matters is the true cost per mile. The dealer networks today represent 25% of the cost of what you spend when you buy a car. When fleets do this, this will not be necessary. There's a simple fact. Your car sits 96% of the time. Many, many times when it sits, it actually costs you money sitting. This will not happen. Autonomous cars managed by fleets will simply operate much more. Other costs, insurance, services, parking will disappear. So it's a major economic incentive. If the cars architecturally get built differently, you end up with a simpler situation yet, which goes back to the resource depletion. It's not just fuel efficiency that's important. It's also how much we put into a car. A car weighs 4,000 pounds on average and tends to move a little bit over one person on average. This is a disproportion that makes no sense. And it has to disappear. Let's remember, we're talking about 3 billion people that want to be like us. So at the end, what I see is that the cars will simply become more air, more purpose-directed, and owned by fleets. What will happen simply because this is such a big economic possibility that there will be enormous in inflows of capital and they will drive this. The legal structure will exist. It's already starting to exist 
and there are people arguing about it. I think Germany right now is resisting it heavily, trying to protect their car industry. England has already legalized it. Some states in America are legalizing it. At the end of the day, as it becomes clear what a boost this is to the economy, the people who want to resist it simply won't be able to do it. I predict that this system optimized will end up bringing the cost per mile down to six cents. When you get to those kind of numbers, I'm going to use an app and forget about driving. The other thing that happens, when computers control cars, you can have a congestion pricing situation. So now visualize um, if you have to go to work. If you insist on being at work at 9 o'clock, you may have to pay more for your driverless car than if you can afford to be there at 10 or at 8. So the computer systems will manage traffic flows too through an economic model, which will help with the congestion that we now have in most cities. So this is a step-by-step -step process that simply solves many of our fundamental issues. The computers will decide what kind of car to send you. If I want to go from Morven to Charlottesville, it'll be an electric car. If after the conference I want to go to Dallas Airport, it'll be a gasoline-driven car, which is, for the record, maybe 150 miles from here. And I may choose to order a special car that might allow me to work on the way to the airport. I won't have to park my car. I won't have to spend the extra 30 minutes to park my car. And I won't have to pay the $100 when I pick up my car. Instead, the car simply sits there. Again, absolute economic imperative and an absolute time saver, making my time more effective. And ultimately, the safety will also be much improved. The result is it will change everything. Now imagine what happens if you're in the taxi business, in the rental car business, or in the parking systems business, if what I say becomes large numbers. I'm not saying that, I, I don't want to predict what happens to what companies. The telephone companies, many of them survived, and they are alive again today. Kodak, as someone who was in the business of making film, did not survive, neither did Polaroid. All I'm saying is what you're about to witness is a major shift, and it is absolutely driven by a major generation of value. Secondary effects. We see it with the telephone. Apps are getting created, little startups are happening. This will happen with cars. Cars will be very busy during commuter times. And in between, they won't be busy. But the capital expense is there. And the car can simply go wherever it needs to go. So what will happen is the cars will be used for freight, for mail, for other things. I suspect the cars will become the booster that will make it possible for the online grocer to get a bigger market share. I suspect it'll be so drastic that some grocery stores today that pay for large parking lots, stormwater retention systems, etc., may end up becoming warehouses that simply use driverless car excess capacity. So now imagine what that does to what your city looks like. It will change everything. So at the very end, it will affect everything positively and negatively. I cannot predict all the details, but for example, public transportation. If I live in suburbia, having a driverless car that takes me two miles to the bus station or train station, and then picks me up downtown and takes me to work, will for sure make my commute cheaper and faster than if I drive a car. Today, I don't want to drive my car one and a half miles to the train station because I don't know where to park it. So public transportation will probably get a boost. Capacity management through pricing, I already mentioned. Productivity of our society will go up. At the very end, I believe this will add an unprecedented amount of wealth. And it will do so much more universally, because the capital barrier is gone. So I believe for the developing world, this will actually be a yet bigger boost. Last. When you shift the way you build a car, which I believe will happen due to the large influx of capital and the absolute imperative for low cost per mile, local production becomes possible. Why does Germany today say we don't want driverless cars? Part of it is guys like me that believe they have to drive and haven't really thought it through. Part of it is they want to protect all those countless jobs of German car companies. 
when an Uber that may decide to make cars decides to build a factory in Germany, that's the first step to get the Germans to start to scratch their head. So at the very end, I think local production is essential because the balance of trade imbalances are absolutely unsustainable. And they are derailing economies, and this cannot continue. It will also be a significant accelerator toward electric cars. Electric cars have the challenges, but they have one promise. When you use electricity for transportation, that electricity can, can come from many, many sources. You can manage it, and you can get the price where you need it. Because the cars get used much, much more than today, there will actually be a net reduction of car production which I actually believe is a good thing, because as we increase the number of people who want cars, if we increase the number of cars, we simply will eventually run out of resources or they will simply become too expensive. And we will end up with individual mobility throughout the world. So even in Africa, where maybe you make $2 a day, when somebody has an idea that's worthwhile, that requires individual transportation, he can implement it on a part-time basis and grow from there. Essentially, it will be an unprecedented shift in the number of jobs, and it will create additional disposable income. And for the economies that are kind of stuck, this additional disposable income is a key. And I believe it will reset and restart our societies, our countries, and essentially create an industrial revolution scale change. And it will be unprecedented.